Well, it was uh, tonight's game was your typical, you know, elimination game. They're desperate. We were determined to win the game, and I thought we had terrific first 35 minutes. Then it got scrambly the last five minutes of the second period. Houston was huge. Um, you know, we lose a player uh, to injury. The bell goes out, so now the lines are jumbled. But we stuck together. It's been going on all year with our team. You hear me say it over and over again. We lose players. You know, we get college guys. We short players. They've just been a resilient group, and um, I think we did a really good job um, converting that res resiliency into third period win. And then tonight, I, I mean, to me, it, Pavel was actually standing out before he, yeah, he, he got injured. Yeah. Uh, what are your your thoughts on on his play before his injury, of course? Well, that line, I mean, Kessie's a banger. He's a big, physical, intimidating guy. Pavel's a dog on a bone, chases pucks down. Steinberg's a heavy hitter. So we had an element that we really haven't had all year. And you could see every time they were on the ice, they were putting pressure on the puck. And I really wasn't worried about the matchup because Pavel's a penalty killer and Steinberg is as well. So I felt confident that no matter what they were putting out, because tonight was their last change, they'd be able to get through a shift and not hurt us. In looking at the playoff slogan, whatever it takes, I was curious if that was a message that emerged from within the group or if the organization sort of applied it. Either way, I wanted to speak to the element of sacrifice that that yeah. seems to embody, because you've talked a lot about the resiliency of this group, but I kind of wanted to specifically key in on the sacrifice component. Sacrifice from our from players' team, perspective? From the yeah, and how it sort of embodies this whatever it takes playoff slogan. Yeah, I mean, I, it's, a, it's a combination of... Um, I think sacrifice and also awareness, like this is what we are. Um, we've talked about going through all these players. And I don't know, like my, 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 my belief is that when people go through adversity and they, they achieve success, right, and they get tighter as a group, um, it gives us like an advantage psychologically. Like we feel really resilient and confident Games are going to have momentum changes, and we can always go back to that, like all the stuff we've been through this year. Uh, and I just think it gives us an extra layer of, of uh, mental toughness and confidence. Our game two is especially fun to coach because it sort of becomes a chess match when you're seeing the same team now in a series and just narrowing it on your strategy. Yeah, I mean, the, the it, you know, it's awkward because you're at home, right? And then they have last change, right? So when you're trying to manage lines and personnel, um, you know, in a, in a game two setting, usually you got, you know, like a two, you know, in the NHL, two, two, one, 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 or in, the, in our other setting, it's a three, two, or two, three, right? So this game's unique, you know, I'm probably bouncing around your question, but it's unique in the sense that we're playing home, it's game two, we don't have last change. They're desperate, right? So they know that going into it. I don't like to play too much into that. Like, we should be desperate too, right? Desperate right. to win the game. And there's always, like, I was fascinated by the psychological um, edginess that teams have when they're when they're in the desperate zone, right? <laughs> and so we're always thinking as a staff, well, how do we create that in our team identity? And we do it. We really do it in practice. Like we have our guys play a lot of second effort drills. I talked about after the second period, second effort in practice, first three strides, last three strides. That should be natural for us, right? We don't have to up our game, whether whether in a game two or a game seven. And then to touch on the the injuries that have been announced, uh, Bocage is out done for the year. Yes. Uh, is there any details on the the type of shoulder injury and that it was? I honestly couldn't even tell you. Like he he fell on his shoulder real awkwardly in the fight in San Jose, and um, it requires surgery. I couldn't tell you what the exact uh, problem is. <clears throat> and then uh, the the Merkley scratch was again due to hot hands. Tonight. Yeah, I mean, it's just, I mean, the, the, there's guys that uh, are playing ahead of him that, you know, um, we've gone with. I mean, he's, uh, and I really like Merckx. He's gotten way better here with us. Um, he's practicing hard, and same as Ferens, they're waiting for their opportunity, but the, the six that we've we've been playing have, have done a great job. So Ferens has, um, has been upgraded from day-to-day to, -day to he's, healthy? He's healthy now, yeah. Okay, yeah. And, and how's Foodie doing? Uh, I have no idea. Okay. Foodie's, uh, you know, he's uh, under Woody's care, so I have no idea.
A player in the defensive group who's really stood out is Sam Lewinsky, and he talked about how he chose Colorado because the way that you like to play complements the way that he likes to play. And I was curious how you strike a balance between players coming in with this preconceived identity versus like a foodie who played juniors as a centerman, comes here, he's on wing, and after that conversation last March, he really takes a huge step mm -hmm. forward because you have a vision for your players too that might differ a little bit from what they knew coming in. I was just curious how you find that balance. Well, Foodie's a really rough piece of clay, right? So he comes in, he's a third round pick, he's a, as they say analytically, he's a puck transporter, that's where his identity is. So we worked on him trying to get him to value his play away from the puck, right? It's going to be a three zone player to play in the NHL, play for the Avalanche. They have this top six heavy team. And he's going to have to, his journey into the NHL is going to have to be in that, in that role. <clears throat> so there's a lot of room for improvement there. Malinsky comes in, he's a 22, 23 year old guy who's got three or four years of college under his belt. He's got an identity already. Had a conversation with his coach, uh, Mike Schaefer, about him. So I, I get to know about the kid. What his personality like, what his natural skill set is. So we kind of have an idea what's what's his natural identity at 23 as opposed to Foody when he's 18 when he arrives here, right? So we're not going to change too much on him in terms of his athleticism, um, but we try and do is find little parts of his game that can improve, right? So whatever he learned at Cornell, that's still going to be weaponry that he can use playing here. But we might add some of that, some of our ideas to him. I got something stuck in my throat <clears> that will make him a better defender, maybe a more efficient um, offensive player. And um, you can see sometimes he carries the puck too much instead of moving it and moving off the puck. And uh, but he's going to learn that. He's a smart kid. He's coachable. Um, I think he's just going to keep, keep getting better and better. The one thing that surprised me about him was that he's not a physically imposing guy, but he's strong on the puck. So when guys have stick strength on puck battles, despite the lack of size and length, that's a big bonus. I know when players like that are <laughs> undersized, but they also aren't worked off the puck so easily, they usually have a low center of gravity. Mm -hmm. It can also interfere with their mobility though. Do you find that at all in his skating or do you actually think that's a strength of his? No, so I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna correct you on the low center of gravity. Guys that have a low center of gravity, they should be able to get out of battles quicker. Okay. Okay, guys like Middleton, Jake's at a high, Right, they have to drop down low to compete with a guy that's six inches smaller. Yeah. So they have an inclination to pop up and then go, where guys that are smaller, they can just take right off. You know, it's a little thing that you'd see when, like, we use a, you know, analogy like your head should be underneath like a clothesline, and then smaller guys, smaller guys' heads are always under it. So when they take off, they just keep, they just take off like on a real athletic position below the clothesline. Yeah. Guys like Mitzi and, and EJ and those guys are big guys. So when they take off, they pop up. So when, a, when, a, when they take off, if the smaller guy gets under them, they win the, the center of gravity battle. So Malinsky's a real good height, real good size, because he's probably six feet, 5'11", but he plays low. When you watch him skate, his hips are low. When he engages in battle, his hips are low. And um, that's something that, you know, it's hard to teach people to do that if they're staying high all the time. So he does that naturally, I think, which is going to really benefit him as he, as he moves up hopefully to the NHL at some point. He likes to drive his shoulder a lot into the yeah. bodies. That yeah. is what I've noticed too. Right, and you can't do that unless your hips are loaded. Yeah. That's all I have. <laughs> That's all I have too. Thank you, okay. Congrats. Okay.